Welcome back, everyone. We've got the second and final day of our conference. Uh, thanks to everyone joining us uh, in person uh, and, of course, online. Today, the campaign continues. We've got important objectives in our uh, plan of attack for today, and uh, we're going to seize the initiative. I know you've been enjoying the conversations, and uh, I think we've got some great sessions on tap for today that uh, will be quite memorable as well. Our first session is a conversation between our award-winning Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian, Dr. Rob Zatino, who presented at our pre-conference symposium on Thursday, and author and award-winning journalist, Andrew Nagorski. Andy's here today to discuss with Rob his latest book, Saving Freud, The Rescuers Who Brought Him to Freedom, which tells the story of the attempt to get Freud out of Nazi-occupied Austria, and it was published just this past August. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob. Thanks, Thanks so Rob. much. Thanks so much, Mike. Good morning, everyone. As, as uh, Grace Slick famously said on Sunday morning at Woodstock, it's a new dawn, and I'm glad to see you all up <laughs> bright and early. You're talking history. Uh, I, this is a treat for me, uh, a Andy Nagorski. Um, you know, he really he needs no introduction, as they say, but of course that means he deserves a very long and fulsome introduction. Uh, and, and Andy has, has traveled the world, and he's been an editor and an author for longer than, uh, than I've been in the business. And he was the bureau chief at, uh, for, for Newsweek uh, at, in Moscow, I, I believe, in the 80s. A couple times. Mm -hmm. um, when it really counted, you know, the, the height of the Cold War, Andy was right there in the, in, in the middle of it. Uh, he's, he's written, uh, um, to go through the entire list might, might sound tedious, but I think it's, it's worth uh, going through a few of them. His book, The Greatest Battle on, on the Battle of Moscow in 1941, is, is to me just, it's a non-pareil look at this, at this great military confrontation. Uh, Hitler Land, how uh, U.S. witnesses to the rise of Hitler, it's a great book, and Andy spoke about it here at the museum. 1941, the year Germany lost the war. You can get an argument about that one in any bar you visit. Um, uh, but the book, Nazi Hunters, perhaps, uh, might be the book for which Andy is best known, but they're all really top flight. So at any rate, Andy Nagorski, it's really good to have you here, man. Good to see you. Wonderful to be yeah. here, Rob. Thanks so much for joining us. So, so today we have an interesting uh, a subject to talk about in a very interesting book. The title is Saving Freud, I think you just heard that, The Rescuers Who Brought Him to Freedom. Um, Andy, tell, tell us if you can, I guess the place always to start, why, why this book, why now, where did the idea come from, and how does that idea kind of germinate into, into this? Yeah. Well, Rob, you and I have talked on occasion when I've been in between books, and uh, I think you realize that that I'm not an author who knows when he's working on one book what the next book will be. There are some authors, like people you've had in this, in, in this uh, conference, I don't know if Lynn Olson is here, but I always envy her. She always so seems to know two or three books ahead of time. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm always, I'm so immersed in whatever the book is that I then need to air out. And then I have what I call my walkabout stage where I'm thinking, <laughs> Yeah, this is obviously a well-covered area, but there, as everybody here, none of you would be here if it weren't for the fact that they, we know that there are always new stories to tell, new ways of looking at events and, and, and personalities. And when I was thinking after my book, 1941, what to write next, at one point, one of the things I do is I read a lot of memoirs, uh, uh, correspondence, whatever that might trigger a thought. And I was reading the memoir of Stefan Zweig. Stefan Zweig was an Austrian Jewish author, mostly of fiction, in the early part of the 20th century. In fact, he was probably the most famous author of that, most popular author of that period. Fairly, in theory, light novels, novellas, but very deft and very, very observant. And he was a contemporary of Freud's, and he wrote a memoir the World of Yesterday, and, and it's a beautifully written memoir about Vienna, a turn of the century, the Habsburg Empire, World War I, and so forth. And at a certain point, he discusses the fact that he knew Freud in Vienna. And just his very graphic description of his few encounters with him made me immediately think, this is a person who we all think we know about. He's such an iconic figure, 
but I knew very little about him as a person, as a three-dimensional man, and, and he just, I, I wanted to know more. And then what really triggered it was the, what I call the eureka moment, was when in 1934, uh, Zweig, as an Austrian Jew, said, you know, things are not going well in this neighborhood. In Germany next door, Hitler has taken power. Uh, people like myself should get out of here. And he leaves Austria. He ends up in London at first. And then the next, next mention of Freud is until 1938. When, when Freud pops up in London after the Anschluss. And I'm thinking, well, why was Freud in Vienna at, during the Nazi takeover? And he mentions that there were these several people who helped Freud get out of Vienna when it was so perilous. And so I wanted to know more. And, and I, when I began to explore the people who helped Freud escape Vienna when it was almost impossible to do so already, I, I realize the historical backdrop is one I know and we all talk about, but the cast of characters is totally different. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a psychologist, uh, and, but uh, it, these, these were a lot of people who were interested, obviously, in psychoanalysis, but also had many other attributes that we'll, I'm sure we'll get into. But, but uh, so I, I thought, here's a tale that most people don't know. And also remember, Freud was born in 1856. So most of them think of him as a turn of the century, early 20th century figure. I'm not sure it had actually registered, I probably knew it, that he died in September of 39, three weeks into World War II. So he spanned all this, this time. He was 83 when he died. Uh, and uh, so he, he really, I think, through his story, you see a lot of the intellectual history of that era, the, the, the Habsburg Empire, and, and, and then, and then an, an incredible saga of one man who I began to feel, feel I got to know through this book in a way I never had any idea about his personality, his quirks, his humor, all, all sorts of things. You laid Freud out on the, on the, on the, <laughs> on the, couch. the couch and you asked him a bunch of questions. Yes, and he talked yes, about yes, us. yes. I just <laughs> listened. <laughs> How important a figure is. So we all, every, you just said something, we all know Sigmund Freud. Everyone has heard of Freud yeah. and you know the sort of Freudian terminology. How important a figure is Sigmund Freud to his time? You know, what, what, a scientist, what were his main contributions to modern science? Well, I think one reason why we don't recognize necessarily how big his impact was at the time, because so many of his ideas had been incorporated into our own psyche and into our own uh, worldview. When he came on the scene, I, I would compare it a little bit to, you know, Copernicus, he, he, he tells us our place in the universe, and Darwin about evolution, and then there's Freud, who, who, who begins to talk about this stuff in this uncharted territory of the human mind, that what you see, you know, the surface that, uh, of all of us, is only a tiny fraction. There was a wonderful story where Anna Freud, his younger daughter, tells about when she was 14, year old, 14 years old and, they were, and her, she was walking with her father around the, the Prater section of Vienna where there are some very nice houses. And her dad said, look, Anna, you see these nice houses? A lot of them have beautiful facades. But what you see inside, <laughs> what's behind those facades is not necessarily so beautiful. <laughs> and in a very simple way, he ex talked about the subconscious, which was, which was really not, not understood, about childhood fantasies, sexual repression, uh, and of course, the core of it, a lot of it, what, what had to do with sexual feelings of, aver of aversions, desires, and how all these kinds of forces, which we may not even be, we're not aware of necessarily, shape who we are. And that was shocking to people. Uh, it's shocking to, you know, now we all say Freudian slip, Freudian that, you know, get on the couch. But the whole the talking cure which he came up with, which was called, became psychoanalysis, and by the way, he had a good sense of branding. The talking cure doesn't work quite as well as, as, as analysis. You pay more money for psychoanalysis <laughs> yeah. than you will for talking yeah. cure. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but so he, he was really revolutionary in his ideas.
One thing I took from the, the book, and, and by the way, Andy, I thought you evoked that era marvelously. So here's a man born in the 50s, 1850s, and he lives into a few weeks into World War II. And I thought you evoked that era well. It was, it was an era of quest, of, of, of people thinking they could unlock the basic secrets of whatever it might be, the atom, the human mind, other areas of, of creation. You know, one thing I took from your book about Freud is his questing nature, the way he always seemed to be looking for a new key. Um, hypnosis electrotherapy, mm -hmm. cocaine, uh, uh, and, and eventually, of course, this, this psychoanalytical process that he worked out. Is that, a good way to, is, is, is that a good way to describe him? Is he the eternal quester? Oh, yes, yeah. I think he was an incredibly ambitious man who claimed he wasn't. Uh, I, when he was courting his, his, his wife, Martha, he wrote to her at one point, I'm not one of these people who feels I have to etch my, my initials on the rock before the, the tide sweeps me away. Well, he wanted people to. People who say that are just the sort of people <laughs> exactly, who want to etch their name exactly, on the rock. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And he, he went to medical school, but he was always looking, well, what can I do that will really somehow constitute a breakthrough? And he was always intrigued by everything from ancient civilizations to current behavior. And so, as you say, he, he at one point, he experimented with cocaine because a friend of his had, a, had cut himself in the lab. He was working in, 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 in a lab, and, and a friend of his is, had cut, cut himself while, while, while performing an autopsy on a corpse and had become addicted to morphine. And there was, and he read in the about the Incas and cocaine, and he became convinced this this might be it. This might be the miracle drug. I can cure my friend, and he began experimenting with his friend, and then with himself. And and, and for a while it seemed, wow, this is unbelievable. And then of course it became another addiction, and he realized this this isn't it. He went to Paris and studied with a man by the name of, of Charcot. Where who was who was who was great in, in hyp hypnosis and, and and seances and and he was intrigued by him, and 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 so he uh, and, and yes very briefly electrotherapy, but he was really looking at the the wor world of the mind and a part of it was in a lab in terms of neurology, but in, in a more it, more, more comprehensive way, he was really thinking, well, how do I unlock that mind? And how do I unlock the minds of people who had what was, was then the general diagnosis was hysteria. That was, that was any, for, for any sort of mental disease. And, and, and so he, that, that became it. And then when, when he and, and one of his mentors seemed to have some success with a woman who had been written off as a quote unquote hysteric, through what he called the talk, talking cure, that became the, the that that major breakthrough. Let's uh, let's fast forward a bit through through Freud's career. By by 19, well by World War One, he's a world famous scientist. Yes, one of the most eminent intellectuals of his day. Um, what are the Nazis who are a post World War One movement? What do they have against Freud? I mean, there's one obvious one that he, he's Jewish, yeah. but. but what do they have against uh, psychoanalysis itself? Why do the Nazis find someone like Freud and his science so repugnant? Well, of course, yes, the Jewish uh, component and their general general disdain for kind of what the, what they saw as effete intellectualism. But they actually even had a a, a uh, clinic in Berlin uh, run by Goering's ne uh, cousin, which dealt with what they called psychotherapy. So there was some psy psychology there, but of course they wanted to separate it from this, this Jewish person in Vienna who they thought was, was subversive. And underlying, the underlying premise though was that people, you know, the master race of course can't have a subconscious with all sorts of dark forces uh, operating. They are noble. They are, they, if they have problems, they are easily fixable. Uh, and uh, it's, they were, they sort of had an, some general conception of PTSD after World War I, although it was not called that, of course. But, but the idea was that uh, 
that the, that the Aryans, the master race, do not have major psychological problems. It's like, remember, when you know, in the old Soviet days, prostitutions in the Soviet Union? No prostitution, no, no drugs, no, you know, everything was, was, was uh, the way you dealt with it is denying its existence. And, and, and the notion that if you accepted the premises of Freud and how the mind work, how can you accept the premise of a master race? Because this is the human mind, no matter what the exterior of that person is. I think of, I guess all totalitarians are always claiming there's, there's, there are no problems in our society. The right. president of Iran not so long ago said there are no gays in Iran. Uh, exactly. Famous, famously. Exactly. So when you're, you're, you're saying that, you know, that how can there be a master race with mental problems? That's really And the other thing. very quick thing is that Freud's, the Freud's theories leads one to one, one major conclusion, and that was lived out in his own life, tolerance. You do not, he did not judge other people's behavior. He tried to analyze it. And that goes against every totalitarian instinct. Sure. sure. <laughs> and Freud had been living in, in Vienna for, uh, for a long time when the Nazis came to power, really, for his whole uh, adult life. Uh, they come to power, of course, first in Germany in 1933, hardly up to tell this audience that. And, and then there's a so-called Anschluss, a union between Nazi Germany and Austria in 1938. But would you say Freud seemed to misjudge the... It's interesting to me, Freud is this observer who seemingly has unlocked all these d secrets that no one else had ever known. But he seemed to misjudge the rise of the Nazi phenomenon or its, or its meaning or the true evil of it. I, I wonder if you comment on that, Andy. Yeah. I mean, on, on the one hand, Freud, in the abstract, understood the rise of totalitarianism and not just fascism, but of communism, the Bolshevik mm -hmm. Revolution. He had, had not... He, he had no patience, for instance, for, for those, uh, there were a number of American, young Americans who came to him for, for, to study or for cures, and uh, they, some of them had gone to Russia and said, oh, there's this wonderful Bolshevik revolution. And he said, mm, <laughs> that's not, it's not so wonderful. Any, any movement that claims that they have all the solutions and is also going to take over everything in the name of the greater good, you better be wary of it. And, and he wrote a, a paper called Civilization and Its Discontents in about 1930 that was very to the point about how far, how brutal people can be and, how, how, and then express it through, through politics, through control of, of others and destroy others and destroy minorities and the particularly Jews who he said often serve that purpose for, uh, for me. But on the other hand, the other thing that struck me about Freud, which I did not understand totally until I got into this, was how much a man of habit he was, of conservatism in the small c, in that he, he grew up in that Austrian-Hungarian empire, in that Vienna, the same Vienna, by the way, that Hitler late, later briefly inhabited at the turn, in the early in the early 20th century, where yes, there were there were there were there was prejudice, there were there was there were extremist movements, but the Austro-Hungarian Empire, with maybe about 50 million people, nine different nationalities, numerous minorities, had, was a fairly by the standards of the times was a fairly tolerant place, and. When he encountered anti-Semitism, which he did, he was aware of, he dealt with it. He never backed away. He, he, would, he would confront it. In fact, a couple of his sons once were pestered by some anti-Semites on, 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 on a lake. Yeah, you during, described that story very yeah, well. Yeah, and, and, and they came home saying, these, these people are shouting at us, threatening us, and, and, and Freud gets out there takes the rowboat across the lake where this crowd of, of anti-Semites is there and they start shouting again. And, and Freud, who uh, it, it has his walking stick and just gets off the boat and starts waving his walking stick like this, this, this very serious professor, and they all scatter. <laughs> and so, and, but the remarkable thing about that story, not only that he had the courage to do that, but his son later remembered, he never mentioned it again. It was, you know, you dealt with that sort of stuff, but Austria, uh, Vienna particularly, was a place where Jews like himself 
yes, they may encounter anti-Semitism, but they could do very well. And he did very well. And for a long time, he hoped that that Austria could survive, even when Austria became a fascist state. But it was a much, much different kind of fascism than the fascism next door. And, and, he, and he was very reluctant to ban it. Also, the other part of it was, that by this point, he's up there in years. And he's had cancer of the jaw for, for, and had numerous operations, the result of his famous cigar smoking. Never, which, never ending cigars. Never, never ending parade. Yeah, you know, he said, I, I, I can't work, uh, I, I can't think unless I smoke my cigars. And if I can't think, I can't write. And he was always writing and thinking. Uh, so he, so he's really hoping he could live out the rest of, he knew he would not live that much longer, that he could, he, he did not like the idea of exile, and, and he was very resistant to it. Let me ask you then, Andy, to broaden this a bit, <coughs> to, to discuss Freud as, uh, as, a, a, as a Jew, as a historic Jew. Jewish communities have a long-standing tradition of reacting to persecution, and it's not to wave your walking stick around. It, yeah, it's, yeah. To, it's to keep your head down, endure, wait, it'll eventually blow over. <laughs> it always does. And the, and the Jews have been living in Europe for well over 1,500 years, and this has not been uh, uh, unfamiliar to them. That tactic had worked for centuries. Is that what Freud and many others are thinking in the 1930s with regards to the Nazis? Is, does he have some sort, I mean, his friend and protege Jung would mm -hmm. probably say there's some historical consciousness inside Freud that he's borrowed the sort of culture of the centuries. I wonder, is, is that what Freud's thinking? Ah, we'll just, we'll keep our heads down. We'll come out the other side, we always have. In part, that was maybe what he was thinking at first. But he did admit that if, for instance, Austria gets taken over by the Nazis, then, you know, sort of everything that he sort of lived for, his Austria will be gone. But he just did not, you know, I think he was like many of us. If we have certain, Habits and by the way, this man, man had had his clothes made by a tailor. A uh, barber who came in in the morning and trimmed his beard uh, had his meals at the very uh, set times. His walkabouts, the Ringstrasse, the the horseshoe-shaped Strasse in, in, in Vienna, and so he had all these habits while being a revolutionary. You think you're a conservative man, and so and like many of us when you're, there seems to be a threat. Uh, I live in Florida, the hurricane is coming. <laughs> and you say, ah, well, they'll <laughs> probably pass me by again. I'm gonna go say. buy some chocolate cleaners <laughs> at Publix. <laughs> yeah, right, some, exactly. some people write it up in Yeah, yeah, and you, you, you here in New Orleans have had a few, a few yeah. such experiences. Absolutely. And so he was very human in that respect. Uh, so he did not want to contemplate the worst, but he could, he could think about the worst. Uh, and in terms of his Judaism, he was not a religious Jew at all. He did not believe in God. Uh, and he, in fact, his wife came from an Orthodox Jewish family, and sometimes he, he sort of uh, needled her a bit about her, her family traditions. But he always made a point of identifying as a Jew, and, he, and as the Nazi threat grew, even more so. He once said, I always identified as German culturally, now I, I ident identify as a Jew. I mean, so he would never walk away from a confrontation, and he felt, and he, he also felt his Judaism helped him, made him a natural outsider, which gave him the courage to expound these theories, which we taught, you know, as we we're saying, how he went from relative obscurity as a medical student to suddenly becoming such a famous psychologist. Uh, at first, the medical establishment was really looking down on their noses at him. Uh, he didn't. He said, "This my the fact that I come from the Jewish tradition means that I can withstand the fact of being an outsider, and 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 and, and I'm not going to let that stop me." So you have this uh, this seizure of power in Austria by the Nazis in 1938, and it's it's clear to a circle of Freud's friends. They're going to have to get him out of the country. Uh, I, I wonder if you can tell us a bit, and it's really the heart of the book, about this rescue team. No one, no one recruits them. They sort of kind of coalesce together, all with one aim, and that's to get Sigmund Freud out of the country before the Nazis do something horrible to him, imprison him, make him recant his teachings, maybe kill him, who knows? Yeah. I wonder if you could tell us a, a bit about that. Let's start with William Bullitt, for okay. example. I'll just say, you said, maybe kill him. I'll get right to one point. <laughs> 
People never th usually don't think about Freud and the Holocaust. But one of the things that also struck me why I wrote this book was would Freud, if he had lived until the Holocaust, he lived to the beginning of the war, but not, not the full Holocaust, would he have survived? Well, there's an answer, I think, to that question. Four of his sisters who did not leave Vienna at that time and then were not able to get out died in the Holocaust in the camps. And that's something most people don't know. One sister had left earlier, married someone, and come to the States. Four died, yeah, one of starvation in Theresienstadt, and, and three in the ga gas chambers of Treblinka. So that, I think that question is, is pretty clear. Um, but uh, the, 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 this group, William Bullitt, okay, so suddenly you have, there is a group of people around Freud, around who, because of his early interest, fame as a as this new, this practitioner of this new new art called psychoanalysis, and all sorts of people come to see him. One of them is William Bullitt. William Bullitt, who had had started his career, he was from an old Philadelphia family, had been a very successful journalist briefly as a very young man and then had, had, had dabbled in diplomacy, had been on Woodrow Wilson's peace mission to, to Europe after the war, was very uh, disenchanted with Wilson. Uh, then he went back to writing, and in 1926, he's having marital problems. Uh, he's married to, by the way, the widow of John Reed, who was the... the, the 10 Days American, That Shook the World. 10 Days That Shook the World. So, I mean, this is another reason I found this book so, fa so fascinating, because with these characters, because there's suddenly it's sort of branching off into all parts of the, the history of this century. And he, is, he's, he, he, goes, he's, he goes to Freud to treat some people, to say, impotence, who knows. But, uh, but he goes to Freud, and they... He became, he's very impressed with Freud, and Freud is very interested in this young man, and they find a common interest in their, dis, dis, their disdain for Woodrow Wilson. Freud, as an Austria-Hungarian patriot, hates what, what, well, how uh, Wilson's role in the dismemberment of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and, 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 and uh, uh, so you've got the two of them who are who are who who are have this uh, decide to write a book together on Wilson? It's not a very good book, and there's a long story about that. It's in in my book, but I'll I'll leave that out. But but then Bullitt becomes gets, gets back in the good graces of the U.S. government, becomes the first U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union in the 1930s, and then he becomes the ambassador to France. And during this period when the Nazis, or when Hitler's moving in on Austria, he's ambassador to France, and one of Bullitt's key priorities is protect Sigmund Freud. He knows he's still Vienna. He had tried to encourage him to leave. He's, he's actually a bit irritated with Freud that he hasn't left. And he, he has one of his closest friends assigned as a consul general in, in, in Vienna to look after Freud and to signal to the new Nazi authorities that the Americans are watching every step of the way, and that's even with an actual U.S. Embassy car pulling up in front of the Freud's apartment at Berggasse 19 with, with the U.S. flag on it to say this was a time when there was still a feeling that Hitler might be swayed by by, by pressure from others. So you have William Bullitt, who's an American diplomat. He's the ambassador to France. Now, the audience is going to start thinking we're making this up. What role does Na Napoleon's great-grandniece, Marie Bonaparte, play in your book, Andy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, it's, we have to have a reference to... Na one reference to Napoleon for yeah, every... Well, this is a pretty conference. significant reference, and that's another... <laughs> Napoleon's brother has a granddaughter by the name of Marie Bonaparte. Grows up in France, and uh, she is uh, very sheltered, her mother had died young, her father's very domineering. She is, she is then, uh, she, she's not royalty yet, but she's very famous, obviously because of her last name, quite wealthy. And then she is married, she, she, an arranged marriage to the prince of Greece and Denmark. So she becomes princess of the Greece and Denmark, living in Paris, 
They have a fairly distant marriage, but, but uh, reasonably amicable. But Marie Bonaparte is, let's say, ahead of her time for a young woman of, those era, of that era, and very active. Uh, she has a procession of lovers, including Louis, uh, Louis uh, Brie, Aristide Brion, who was prime minister of France several times. And despite this very active life, she's sexually frustrated. She cannot achieve orgasm. And I'm afraid, you know, in a Freud discussion, we have to throw in a few <laughs> such terms. <laughs> And, My children are watching. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's bleep that out. Um, and and she, she if, uh, finds a psychologist, uh, a, someone who follows Freud in France, and says, I have to get to, Fr to Freud. And she has the wealth and power, and she eventually convinces someone to introduce her to Freud. She starts going to Vienna for treatment, and it was totally entranced by Freud, not only because of, of, of what he can, the way he psychoanalyzes, but he decides, she decides she wants to become a psychoanalyst. She wants to help him spread this movement. And, and from then on, she's one of his closest colleagues. And, and Freud immediately takes to her. And he, despite, they have such contrasting lifestyles, views on so many things, but they bond in an incredibly close way. And she becomes a key player in this rescue plan. <laughs> You have a, a, a other dramatis persona. <laughs> we probably shouldn't go through all of them. We'll let, we let want, we want people to buy the book and read it. But for his daughter, for example, Anna. Yes. But there's also, you know, throwing in for good measure. There's a Nazi uh, yeah. in this group of individuals who helped get Freud out of Vienna. His name is Anton Zauerwald. Can you tell us yeah. something about what, what was uh, Zauerwald's role in this story? This, for me, was one of the biggest surprises. I mean, yeah, a lot of these characters were new to me, but Sauerwald and there, was, there wasn't a lot known about him. When the Nazis took over Vienna, when, when the Anschluss happened, they assigned someone called a trustee to each prominent Jewish family. And of course, Freud was a target. He was both successful professionally, world famous and all that. And the idea, this is again, before, this is 1938, it's before, before it's clear that the, there's gonna be a full-blown Holocaust, the idea, at the very least, is extort as much wealth as possible. And then it's unclear, are they going to let these people emigrate? Are they going to be thrown in camps or what? So a lot depended on the trustee. And the trustee here was Sauerwald, someone who had gone to the University of Vienna, studied chemistry, and then gone into the Nazi movement. And he first burst into the Freud's apartment and, and into their printing press. and spewing normal anti-Semitic, uh, uh, you know, really hate and, and sounding like he's going to be awful. But then he begins hanging around. He has to go through all the, 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 the records, the finances, and so forth. And he also starts reading Freud's works, which are on the bookshelves there in Freud's apartment. And he, and he begins to clearly show some respect for Freud. In fact, when some other SS guys come in, he tells Anna Freud, the daughter, well, you know, those are Prussians. They don't really know how important Freud is. Uh, <laughs> Down here in uh, civilized Austria. Yeah, right. civilized Austria, exactly. And, and eventually, uh, and also, he at one point, when he was a student, one of his favorite professors was a chemistry professor who was an elderly Jewish chemistry professor had since, since died. And despite his despite his Nazi beliefs, he looked up, back on him fondly. And Freud had known that professor. And his, again, personal connections matter, even in the grand sweep of history. And, and I think he began transferring some of his respect for that professor to Freud. And at a key moment, I won't go into all the details, that's, that's in the book, but uh, uh, he makes a decision not to reveal some information about Freud that might have doomed Freud, that might have prevented him from ever getting out of Austria, and he withholds that information from his superiors just long enough for Freud to get out of the country. So the Nazis were correct. Freud is dangerous. The Nazi <laughs> yeah. reads Freud, and, and he's not, not converted, Absolutely. perhaps, but yeah. yes. converted to a sense of humanity, at least. Yeah. I found that to be the most interesting <laughs> single thing I read in the book. So you have, this, you have this very distinguished group. They're kind of motley, I would say. They've been yeah. drawn together from various, uh, from various regions, England, France, the United States, even 
throwing a Nazi for good measure. Tell us about the mechanics, if you will, Andy, just a bit about Operation Freud, which is what they called it, yes. how, to get, how to get Sigmund out of Vienna. He's, you know, he's not particularly enthused about it. He eventually gets convinced it's going to have to be done. But can you tell us a yeah. bit about Operation Freud? When the Anschluss happens, and Hitler on March 15th of 38 is speaking in Vienna, proclaiming the end of Austria, that's a short walk from Freud's apartment. If any of you have ever been to it, it's now the Freud Museum in Vienna. And even then, Freud is still a bit hesitant. And, but uh, this rescue squad springs into action. Marie Bonaparte says, I'm coming from Paris. Uh, I'm going to do everything possible. And there's another member of this rescue squad, Ernest Jones, who's a Welsh psychologist from, who lives in London, who was an early follower of Freud, who who had studied, studied German just to read Freud before he was translated much. And he comes, swoops in. And, and there are two parts to this rescue plan. Convince Freud, the game is up, do everything possible, get out. And that happens pretty quickly. Jones, Jones comes in and, and argues with him. Others do. But the key moment is Anna Freud, who's the, the youngest daughter, who is an incredibly courageous young woman, she takes over dealing with the Nazis <laughs> because you've got, and she wants to protect her father, who's in his early 80s. And so at one point, the, the, the Gestapo pulls, uh, grabs Anna Freud and takes her away. And Freud is just beside himself. This was his favorite child and the closest to him personally and professionally. And all day she's gone. And by the time she finally shows up, he's so relieved. He says, no, we have to get out of here because she has a future. I may not have much of a future. My wife, Martha, may not have much of a future, but she has to live on. And so she does the, the negotiation, which is about basically how much money we're going to pay. Extortion. Extortion. It's, it's, it's extortion. It's called a flight tax. And Marie Bonaparte, by the way, puts up most of that money at first. Uh, Freud later makes a point of trying to pay back what he can. And Anna and getting the permissions, and just one, 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 one little touch. At, at, at finally, when they navigate all this, and finally they they give give him a piece of paper to sign, saying, "Okay, we're going. You, you are, you're okay to get out. You sign this paper. We never mistreated you. We never prosecuted you. The new authorities in in in, Austria, in the Third Reich uh, now with with." control of Austria have always been, you know, basically gentlemen. And he knows he has to sign this paper. And while he's, you know, while, and, he, and, he, and he starts, he gets ready to sign it, and there's a, there's, a, there's a Nazi official behind him looking to make sure he signs it. He says, can I just add one thing? I would recommend the Gestapo to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> A sense so, of humor there at the yeah. end. Yeah, <laughs> and his housekeeper who overheard this you know, almost fell through the floor. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the, he, that's the other thing I liked about Freud is that even when you know this, this is a rather <laughs> a dangerous joke, but but he 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 had a sense of humor even despite his dour experience. You know, I. I we're coming to the end of our uh, conversation, Andy. We're going to throw it open to the tender mercies of the crowd here okay. in, in, in a moment. Sure. Um, what I took away from your book is, is, is Freud's importance to the modern world. I mean, you, you, you touched on this earlier. Everyone, we all know words. A Freudian slip you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. There's ego and there's id. Yeah. Um, the Oedipus complex. Oh, uh, yes. Even terms like trauma. Um, he, even, he shows up in shows up in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Mm. They call him Frude, <laughs> yeah. if yeah. you've yeah. seen, the, seen the film. How would you... Uh, what is his importance to our own day? We talked about his scientific innovations at the yeah. time. But why is Freud important today? You know, I've talked to, since I did this book, one thing I've got to say, I was a little hesitant venturing in this field. Again, I'm not a, no, not a psychologist. I took Psych 101 in college. What does that get me, you know? Uh, but I've been interviewed by various psychologists, psychiatrists. I was in, in, in London recently for the British edition. And I'm thinking, and, and one of the top psychiatrists interviewed me. I think, oh my God, you know, just really don't grill me on the, on the, on, the details, on the details yeah, right. of, 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 the, of the science. They were, they, for them, it was also this, this, they wanted to know about the person because, because I think his ideas have so permeated 
our consciousness, that even as a lot of psychologists start when I talk to them about it, saying, oh, I'm not a Freudian, that's a little passe, you know, and there are all sorts of theories and schools, but everything, the starting point was Freud. For every, every I think, yeah, our understanding of the human mind today, and every psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, has some notion, has, has internalized some of his concepts. And the whole idea that we do not understand necessarily why we do certain things, or what the significance of our dreams are, or, uh, or why so we can have physical manifestations of things that have, seem to have no physical cause. Uh, that, these are all things that Freud was the first one to explore, and, and for that, I think, you know, he, I think his legacy continues to be huge. Great. I think you can almost look at the Nazis and judge them by the number of brilliant minds they drove out of the country. Oh, yes, yes. Einstein yeah. would be another one, of course. Yeah, yeah, and by the way, Einstein and Freud once met in, in 1927, and here's another example. For Freud, if Freud, afterwards, Freud is asked, well, how was your meeting with Einstein? He said it was wonderful. He knows a bunch of, uh, as much about psychology as I do about physics. So we had a very <laughs> nice conversation. <laughs> as they say, on that note, um, thank you so much, Andy. Sure. A brilliant book, and again, it's Saving Freud. <laughs> now, somewhere out there is Jeremy Collins, I believe. I don't see him right He's now. Right. And there he is. Jeremy? Great. We'll start in the center, halfway back, please. Great. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you make it so easy. great. Well, I actually have a PhD in industrial psychology. Oh, oh boy. Uh -oh. So, uh, <laughs> I'm running away. <laughs> I studied the history of psychology getting that PhD, and uh, even though I'm not a Freudian, I was an antecedent behavior consequence kind of person, Freud was the one who started people thinking about the processes in your head and making that important. And, from a World War II perspective, the invention of psychological tests, as you would call them, were actually intelligence tests. And in the U British Army, if you were a, a, a nobleman, you got to be an officer. Mm -hmm. But the ability to take people who didn't have a lot of education and identify what their abilities were to learn enabled people who came from different lower backgrounds or less education to move up in the world because they knew they were smart. And before those kind of tests, they were not qualified to do things because of their background, but those tests helped the military, especially in World War I, begin to find the people who were capable of you know, doing artillery or things like that. So his influence <clears throat> for, for the military is huge because he and his colleagues of that time invented separating your level in the world from your intellectual ability to prosper if you were given the chance. Yeah. Any comments on that? Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I agree completely. And it's also interesting that by, you know, by the time, you know, in World War II, the psychology, psychologists are at work during Nuremberg trials, the U.S. sends a, a top a psychologist to try to analyze these guys who are going who are who who, have, who are in the dock. Uh, it, it's sort of a, an irony that the Nazis who who actually they actually in, in the burning of the books in 1933 and they, they threw in Freud's books and they are among many others. Uh, but then those uh, those same the people and those theories are applied to to those who lost the war. We there actually um, did Rorschach tests, yes, that, that, yeah. which have been published. The, the Rorschach tests of the hot, top Nazi Dante. leadership have been published. You know, you, you ink blot, and then you, yeah. you say, what does it suggest to you? And yeah. they say things like, it looks like a child ripping an insect apart or something. You know, they, they, <laughs> yeah, right, they're clearly right. deranged. Well, what's, what's a clue? <laughs> they're clearly deranged men. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna stay in this row to your right, please. You mentioned uh, that uh, in the early days of, of the uh, um, that Austrian fascism was different from German fashion, and I'd like you to explain how it was and how maybe how it kind of degenerated toward the Nazi version over time. Okay, good question. very good question. Yeah, I mean there was a, a a fascist movement in Austria, but there were and there were some 
Austrian fascist who became basically a Nazi sort of paramilitary. But the Austrian fascists, and they elected a, a, a prime minister named Dolphus, who is this very diminutive man, but who was, they, they were, while they had some racist doctrines, certainly because they're fascists, but they did not implement the kind of draconian racist policies, especially against Jews, uh, that, uh, and there's a tradition of that, by the way, a mayor, the mayor of Austria, of Vienna, in the turn of the century, was a very famous man by the name of Karl Luger, who's often invoked as this, this very nasty mayor. Uh, and in fact, Hitler, when he was in, in Austria in the, in the early part of the 20th century, looked to Luger and some of his anti-Semitic theories as a justification for some of his own early ideas. But Luger, the, the Jewish community in Vienna always maintained ties with him and managed to somehow negotiate uh, a, a reasonable, you know, kind of kind of live and let live policy, and so there was, uh, and, and the other, and and one of the ironies is when the Austrian fascist movement took place in the, the early 30s, they looked to buffer themselves from Hitler and the Nazis, and they looked to Mussolini for help. Mm -hmm. Uh, thinking Mussolini, he's got the South Tyrol and all that. He doesn't want to have, there's still this idea that there can be a balance between the dictators. Mm -hmm. Of course, Mussolini basically loses that contest very quickly, but initially there was hope that Italy would be a bit of a, a shield for, for this. So that the idea, and, and Freud very frankly writes about the fact that he thinks our Austrian extreme right-wingers could be our protection. Uh, that obviously proved to be an illusion. I, and and uh, yeah, I think that Austrian history, as you know, is very complicated in the way it's portrayed. It is not the sound of music, uh, uh, but even though that's a great film, uh, and 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 uh, the, the the Austrian identity. But there was an attempt to save that. But there also was that counter pull of Austrians who consider themselves German, mm -hmm. who not necessarily Nazis, but German. So it was a very complex mix. And in the end, of course, they were overwhelmed. We're gonna stay towards the center, towards the back, please. Um, and in um, your research and thinking about Freud, did you also think about the significance of German-speaking Jews in the intellectual history of the, of the century. Uh, it's been said that the three most consequential figures were Karl Marx, Albert Einstein, and Sigmund Freud. And did you have a sense of um, the importance of that culture and history um, to that period of time? Good question. Too. Yes, uh, good question. Rob alluded to this too, that one of the, the, the aside from whatever moral judgment you make, one of the stupidest tactical strategic decisions of the Nazis was to drive out so many brilliant people. And that was true in Vienna, that was true in Berlin, certainly. Why did Einstein leave? Yeah, he, he left earlier than Freud and he was not waiting around. Uh, so uh, the contribution was huge. In, in Vienna, about 10% of the population was Jewish. But if you looked at uh, uh, at the arts, about uh, science, you know, academia in general. Physicians. Uh, uh, physicians. Yeah, phys physicians, of course. Yep. Uh, uh, Jews were overrepresented there, and you know, not disproportionately represented. And again, that speaks to the fact that people could rise and could be very successful there. And that's why people, uh, Jews from all parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire gravitated to Vienna, which was this glittering imperial capital in those days. Uh, and so I, I, the, the, contra, the cultural, I don't go into huge amount of, uh, in, in this book about it, but that was the atmosphere in which Freud grew up and uh, as was then you know, Berlin in the 20s too. Uh, I always remember the stories of Americans who saying in Berlin in the 20s, you'd go to a party and Albert Einstein would just show up, you know, have a drink. And, and in Vienna, you could, you know, you'd have Gustav Mahler and uh, 
Kokoschka and you know all, all you know any any kind of arts and and it, you know, a, you know the, the cream of society. So and that's why I think you know, we all still like a lot of us still find a, a city like Vienna just irresistibly attractive despite its tortured history. I mean, much of Hitler's appeal, I think, was that he was deliberately rejecting all those all those great thinkers. Yes. Yeah. You know, pointy-headed intellectuals, effete intellectuals who have nothing to do with the common man. And, and, and Hitler deliberately called out their Jewishness. It was, it was, he said, you know, this yeah. is what we have to get, exactly what we have to get yeah, rid of. Yeah, there were really two, v I, I, I say that, yeah, there were kind of two Viennas. And, you, and I can almost imagine, I mentioned to someone this morning at breakfast that, you know, for a brief time, Hitler was living in Vienna. And, of course, Freud was there. Imagine them, they might have crossed, you know, walked right by each other on the street in Vienna in those days. And it's quite a concept to, to think about, but but it was there was kind of uh, there was a there was Freud's Vienna, which was very intellectual, artistic, scientific, and there was Hitler's Vienna, this down and out guy who was rejected when, when he wanted to go to to art, art school. That's an admissions committee I would like to talk to. <laughs> 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 um, and, Let's and, have a look at that portfolio yeah, one more time. Yeah, and and, and because of that re and that sense of rejection, <laughs> he takes it out, as you say, Rob, on, on everybody. He said, all everybody, and and you know, who's the most convenient scapegoat are the Jews. Now Hitler spent uh, Christmas of 1912 in a homeless shelter. Yeah, living yeah. in living in Vienna. You mentioned down and out. That's a perfect down and out. And sometimes he was literally sleeping on the street. Yep. All the way in the back to your right, please, gentlemen. Rob and Andy, I want to thank you for a, a great discussion, conversation. It's great to have a panel on Freud here at the museum. I, I just wanted to make uh, just a brief comment, then a, a question. Since Andy and Rob have drawn our attention to the connections between Freud's theory, Nazism, and the Holocaust, it's also worth noting that a man named Peter Frulich, he was a German Jew who got out in the late 30s, comes to the United States, becomes known as Peter Gay, oh, yes. becomes obviously one of the leading biographers, scholars working on Freud and psychoanalysis, so highly recommend his uh, work, and he wrote a memoir about his time in Germany in the 30s. Andy, the, the question I have is, after doing all this work on Freud, do you see any elements in his theory that help us make sense of fascism? That it, it's a movement that depended so much on psychology, uh, on understanding crowds and, and spectacle and what would really stir people. And, and so obviously it's, it's a perfect subject for psychologists, for psychoanalysts, et cetera. You see any el elements of Freud's thought that can help us better understand it? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's Good an question. excellent, yeah. And first of all, thanks for that acknowledgement of Peter Gay. He's a wonderful writer and his biography, his, his one er, biography of Freud, one of the early ones was, was yeah, obviously a great resource and I've read others of, uh, others of uh, works of his and he really knew his subject well from, mm -hmm. uh, from Indeed. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the irony I think also is, I would say Hitler had a br pretty good instinctive sense of psychology, early, especially early on. If you read the descriptions of when he was in that stage in Munich, when he was an agitator for this tiny party in the beer halls, and how he performed, and his sense of theatricality, uh, we always see these clips of Hitler ranting and raving. Well, that's not the Hitler most people saw in those, immediately in those settings. He was, people who observed him then, and I've gone back to see some of those firsthand observations, would talk about how he would talk, start very softly, talking about the, the, all the frustrations of post-World War I Germany, the inflation, the poor housewife who, who can't put food on the table, the, the humiliated veteran, you know, they've lost the war and they're being punished for it even more, 
And then he gradually ratcheted up and, and the crescendo. And, that, and he knew how to stage it. And one thing, one time, uh, you know, so he, he had all sorts of theories about how to do that. And a lot of them were quite, quite good about, for instance, holding rallies at night instead of the day because he knew at night people were more susceptible to be moved, their emotions. And he understood there were subconscious emotions there. He didn't put in those terms. So in some ways, if Hitler had been a different person, he might have appreciated some of, some of the stuff Freud had to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, he, and, and he worked that very, very successfully. And then, of course, Freud would have had a fun time analyzing Hitler. Uh, um, but uh, so, so I, I think, and I think one of our one of the reasons we're, I think all of us are fascinated by this period and by the Nazi movement is because of psychology. It goes beyond just what the Germans did or the Austrians or whichever, because it's about human behavior. How are human beings capable of this kind of behavior? And that's the ultimate fascination for it, regardless of their nationality or what uniform they're wearing. But it's most manifested, of course, in the Nazi movement. And that's a question of psychology, of perhaps of, uh, of mythology too, and all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of things. So I think all of these you, you try to apply those tools, although I will say, for instance, like with the Nazi psychologist at Nuremberg, uh, the, the, the American psychologist at Nuremberg, people trying to find, you know, what was the key yeah. that set off these people to go, some of whom were pretty well educated to do the things they did and act the way they did. Nobody came up with a satisfactory answer. Or for Hitler, right? Or for there, Hitler. There's, there's that sense that you'll just find that, that magic moment. But I've often thought that's kind of a trivialization of Freud. Yeah. Much more of putting your personality yeah. together is a process. Yes. So you sort of do it every day. It's not something that one thing that you can point to. And that's why also psychoanalysis is a process. Yes. He, he never believed that you, you're just going to come in and I'll, you know, oh, that's your problem. Here's how to fix it. No, it didn't. that's not the way it works. <laughs> that's right. Ladies and gentlemen, a great start to our great. morning. Thanks to Rob Satino and, of course, Andrew Nagorski. Andrew,